Coming up, we've worked hard to bring you another great episode. You know what would make my day? If you listen, yes, but you can really make me smile by subscribing. You can go to offthenose.com or on whatever platform you're using right now. They all have that little subscribe button. Go there right now, click that, and boom, happy Kelly. If that's not enough, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Insta and Twitter. You can share the episode with your friends or colleagues. So many options to show your love. But let's just start simple and subscribe today, right now. Don't put it off. You guys rock. Hey everyone, our guest today is Robbie Wade, Luxury International Travel Consultant. Robbie's favorite quote is, The shortest path to oneself leads around the world. And I bet you guys are feeling like I am. Get me out of here. How do we travel out? Out of our house? Out of our minds? Yeah. Out away from the news? Maybe away from our children? (gasps) just an idea, people. Well, today we're going to find out where can we go, what are the rules, what are the new norms, and yeah, there are places you can go, and there are places you can plan for. It's off the nose travel. It's not normal. You haven't heard of it. It's unexpected. Let's go. Gotta get it how it goes now. You gotta take it off the nose. It's off the, it's off the nose. Gotta get back in control now. Let's stop believing in ourselves. It's off the, it's off the, it's off the nose. Okay, excited, Robbie. We are so excited to have you on today. As you know, we are all about off the nose moments, and I know that you became a Lux International Travel Consultant by taking one of those forks in the road, pivots, if you will. So before we get into how the hell you're going to get us out of our houses and off into fun land all over the world, hopefully, super excited to hear about those ideas, tell me what was that off the nose moment? How did you get in the position you're in now? We want to know. Sure, great question. Um, Well, you know, I always loved to travel and I had a few different careers, which I really enjoyed, but um, took some time off and was raising my kids. One of my sons was about to go off to college, who I was completely engulfed in his life. And I remember being Mm -hmm. on a trip to Cinque Terre Mm -hmm. which is in Northern Italy. It's um, five towns that are connected by a hiking trail. You can't get there other than by hiking. Yeah. Um, There's no car access. So it's really, really cool. And um, And each town is a little bit different. Remind me where are you flying into for Cinque Terre? Um, You can fly either into uh, Pisa or that's the closest or Florence or Genoa. Italy. That's They're all right. about an hour and a half drive. Okay. Um, okay. So you're in Cinque Terre. Okay. Hiking shoes on. Hiking shoes on. Hiking from town to town. And um, it's just, you know, you're overlooking the sea. Um, it's crystal clear blue. Each town's a little different. The people are amazing. It's a throwback in time. And, um, you know, I just, I realized that um, the shortest path to oneself really leads you around the world. And so travel really has the ability to change you. And so I'm sitting there thinking, what do I want to do for the rest of my life when my kids leave? And there's nothing I would rather do. And to share those experiences with people, I really feel like you can create life-changing moments and pivots for those people that, you know, kind of go hand in hand with those other pivotal moments like, you know, a marriage or having children or, you know, divorce or death or something major in your life, I think travel is one of those things. And so to be able to help people create those experiences, you know, and to share that and to share what I feel from travel was kind of an easy next step for me. That's cool. And did you, were you, I mean, obviously you've traveled, which we're going to talk about. So you knew you wanted to be, you know, the travel industry sounded interesting probably figured out how the hell do I get paid to do this? 
you had had exposure? Had you always used a travel agent or a consultant for your own stuff? No. Um, is I, I did a little bit, and that's who I actually work with right now. My partner um, is one of the top travel advisors in the country, and um, I, I have used her for more you know, unique trips or for trips that I wasn't familiar with, but I did like to create them on my own. So I started to work with her when I'd create trips and she actually asked me if I'd want to, you know, continue to work with her because I obviously had such a passion for it and a knack for it. But, you know, there is a lot of information out there now. Um, but I think what people are craving and is more, you know, unique experiences or, you know, things that are, a little harder to figure out and more exotic locations and it's a lot of work to be able to do this right so, um, so did you have to study or or if someone wants to get into this is there a certification or you come on under somebody like you did as an apprentice what, what's the path to get in yeah it was actually hard to figure out I tried to research it myself and it wasn't so easy to figure that out. Um, no, you don't need a certification. You need to be under, you have to have an, it's called an IATA. It's a, a special number that you're approved to book travel. And it's hard to get as an individual. Usually you do have to be under an approved agency. So there's many agencies that'll take you under their wing and then they'll train you or they'll give you a mentor. Um, and it is a lot of work to learn, you know, the, the back end systems, you know, for the mm. airline. Learn and everyone everything. has their own system, I would imagine. Um, there's a few major ones that everybody can use the back end system. And then you make money off of, I mean, we don't need to see your tax returns, but you make money percentages and it's different off hotels versus cruises versus whatever. I mean, are there booking fees as well? How do you make money? You know, your own, your own independent business um, and each person handles it different, but yes, you don't charge the client anything necessarily if you don't want to. And we, you know, have consortium rates and group rates through our agency so that we can offer the client better pricing. And then the hotel will give us a, a percentage and cruises as well. Um, some people do charge booking fees. So it's really up to each individual person. But yes, you can make a, a modest living if you don't charge booking fees through the kickbacks that you get through the So hotel. is this a, you know, I used to call the, some, some jobs, you know, my manicure jobs, right? It's going to cover my fun stuff or, and you, and you could work part-time and have nice life work balance and raise kids. And then if you want to go all in, you can make as much money as you want to make. Is that this field? I would say that. Yes. I mean, I'd say the average Travel agent is not making, it's more fun money. Um, but yes, if you want to go all in, um, it's a little bit more of a 24 hour a day job if you're all in because people are all over the world. But yeah, yeah you make a very nice living if, if you're one of those people. Very lucrative. And um, I, I would think much. that you can't exactly put do not disturb on when your people are traveling. What, what's, what's that look like? What's the expectation of a travel agent? Do you book it and you're done? Or what is the expectation? Not at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's hell. That's one of the drawbacks is you are 24 hours. You're on different time zones. You know, I have to make calls at midnight to reach people, you know, just to reach them in, in Africa, let's say, or in Asia. So there's always, no matter how well you plan something, there's stuff that happens, as we all know. So flights get changed, flights get canceled, hurricanes happen. Coronavirus happens, and you know you have to put out fires. I would say mm. is the best way to describe part of what we have to do. That's not the fun part, but you know it's very nice for the clients to be able to have that person to help in those kind of scenarios, and they happen unfortunately. So sure, I would imagine. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I know you handle mostly high end um, luxury trips. You you probably take on friends of friends kinds of trips as well. The higher the clientele, the more expensive the trip, the more demanding or not necessarily? What, do you, what have you seen? Hmm. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that at all. I really feel like it's just different personalities, mm. um, different expectations. I really wouldn't say that. And 
That's good, I, I guess. <laughs> yeah, really, yes, it, it, it really is not necessarily that way. Um, I have great clients that'll spend a fortune and they're super easy. And I've had clients that, you know, it's a couple hundred dollar trip and I'm 24 seven. So yeah, you have to. That's so funny. It's just personality. Yeah. So, so you, the hours and the surprises, I guess I would imagine. I mean, I've certainly tried to rebook a trip or cancel or change and the weights on hold and the, you know, the time involved and sometimes the money. I mean, that's certainly the, pain in the ass part of travel. So I would imagine that's your pain in the ass too. Do you get perks? I mean, I think, you know, I certainly would think that you guys get perks or how does that work? How do you get exposed to all these great places? Sure. Uh, well, one thing that's great is that we have people from all over the world come visit us every week in our agency. So, you know, they come to us. Um, there's great trade shows that we get to go to, but Yes, we are invited on, they're called fam trips, and, and um, I've been invited all over the world. It's a little bit hard to go when you're working or you have kids, but when you can take advantage of them, they're great, and they really take you to have the full experience, whether it's the hotels, meet the local tour guides, you know, have the full experience, and then, of course, you can sell it better, and, and it really is a, a much better way to be able to, you know, serve your clients when you've personally been there and had the been experience. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as much as you can take advantage of that, you know, they are available. So I could go every single week of the year if I so chose on one of these trips. Wow. Mm -hmm. You just have to pay for your flight. So that is a perk. You just you have, have to pay for your flight. flight. Okay. Yeah. That's um, a huge it's, perk. It's huge. You have to pay for your flight. And usually that's about it. And some people will spend their first year and it's an investment in their business. And they'll just say, I'm going to take advantage of every single trip that I can. And, you know, it's kind of like an education. You pay for an education. So I you know, love that. Like that. Yeah, that, that would be the way to do it. <laughs> and who puts that all together? I mean, because if you're doing excursions and hotel, I know you said you pay for the air, but who, who is like really behind that? Is that the concierge of any given hotel? No, it's usually um, they're local tour companies. We call them DMC, so I won't bore you with all the, the names, but um, the local tour operators will put it together, and you know, and then of course they usually want us to use their services the next time we book an area, and they'll take us to maybe five different hotels, different brands in a collection, you know, different activities, and they kind of put it all together. You know, there are on the ground eyes and ears too for when we do send clients because that's been that's very helpful when we have people on the ground um, in the local time zone mm -hmm. that every single detail and um, so we rely on them a lot so it's in both of our best interests to work together and yeah so those are the people who are behind it and you know sometimes the hotel like a four seasons will say come join us and you can visit five of our hotels within a five day period and send us around, but usually it's a tour operator of some sort. So do you think there are, I mean, in any given industry, there are great uh, people and there are, you know, not so great and maybe not so above board. I mean, I'm picturing a lot of greasing of the hand, you know, I mean, you could get some kick ass trips paid for uh, just by sending people on this, same standard type itinerary. I mean, is there a lot of that template type travel recommendations going on from agencies? Or is that about the consultant? I think it's about the consultant. Honestly, I mean, our whole world has become, you know, a little bit cookie cutter. So that's definitely out there. You know, pack, free packaged. Mm. And, you know, when you talk about travel, you can have a, a, an experience that works for some people where they're, you know, tour bus to tour bus with 80 people on the bus and everything's pre-planned and they, Oh my God, shoot me, shoot me too. And yeah. Yeah. I, so, you know, again, that that's, it's out there and, and it is a lot. And some people actually like to travel like that. Don't ask me how, but they do. And, um, so, but that's not, that's not what I do. And, and I think that's not the direction, the future direction of travel and agencies and, and travel consultants because, you know, anybody could go look that stuff on with all the available resources online. So, yeah, 
Um, yes, yeah, so you hear a lot about, I'm going to say millennials, I think we throw them out as a category a little too much, but, you know, let's say um, 35 and younger, you know, you hear about them wanting more experiential travel, you know, they want boutique, they want small, they want things like this. Today, I was listening to the CEO of Airbnb, and he was saying that he believes that things are going uh, more localized. And he doesn't mean Americans are going to stay in America. But what he means is that he thinks people are going to look for travel that are not in these big groups and that are, you know, more special about small towns. He said he thinks there's going to be a resurgence of small towns and over the next, you know, for the next 10 years. And then, you know, not that cities will go away, but, you know, that's his prediction. Now, obviously, you're on whatever we are. We've all lost track. Yeah. Fourth month of a pandemic where most of the world is, you know, scared to be in a group of any kind, unless you're, you know, under 25, they could give a shit. But so who wants to go get on a tour bus, even if it's allowed? Who is going to go stay in a, a big Marriott? Sorry. You know, so is it logical, you know, what he's saying or what, what, are you, what do you think and what are you hearing? A hundred percent. And outside of even, you know, COVID, yes, that's the direction. I think that the millennials are actually, surprisingly, you know, they want to go to small villages. They don't, they want to go to off the beaten path. And I a hundred percent agree with that. Smaller towns less crowds for all those reasons. And I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. So to me, I'm just thinking that through not knowing your business, but it seems like there would be a need for more travel consultants because, you know, it's fairly easy to go online and figure out kind of the big stuff. Sure. It seems like it would be a little harder to figure out the little nook and cranny, you know, the restaurant that's hidden, between the set of steps, you know, in, in Italy and so forth. Like, so do you think that the use of travel consultants is going to increase or was it already increasing uh, pre-corona? It was increasing and I think it'll go back. And I think it, that we were considered a dying, you know. Yeah, you know, I didn't want to say that, but. <laughs> the dinosaurs dying, dying, all this stuff, you know. Right. I mean, I heard that when I was getting into travel. Does anybody use a travel agent anymore? Right. And, you know, absolutely. You are spot on because that's the exact reason. And You can't get those unique experiences on, on your own. Totally. And the, the millennials really don't want to do this stuff, to be honest. And part, partly they like to control it things and take charge of their own destiny, but you know, they can't be bothered with some of this stuff. Mm, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, when you put it all together, if they have a good experience with you, then you're, you're their girl or their guy. Yeah. I do think that that's absolutely true. So, so we're in Corona mm -hmm. in case you didn't know what's, what's happening on your end. I mean, you know, the last 10 phone calls, you know, you receive, what are you hearing? People are antsy. I'm getting yeah. calls, you know, are the borders open? Are the borders open? Can mm. I go? You know, people want to go and they don't want to, a lot of local travel, which is great. And I do think it's, it's, we maybe haven't appreciated what's right in our backyard. So this is a great opportunity for people to explore the U S and do it in different ways. So we're getting calls like that. Um, but people really want to travel again as soon as they can. And shockingly, people who you would not think, you know, older people. I had a, a client who was celebrating his 100th birthday. That was the last person to cancel the trip that just canceled, you know, a few days ago. Um, and when was his trip scheduled for? for? <laughs> he was scheduled for September. This September, and he just now canceled. Just canceled this week and didn't wow. have to. Uh-huh. But you know, I think his family kind of convinced him at this point, but he was all set to go. 
last very last person to cancel a trip <laughs> maybe at a hundred you know you, you yeah, figure exactly. that's what i was thinking that's how i want to go out i want to be on a on a cool train or sailing in the mediterranean not stuck at home so and and i have other other older people who want to go they're not afraid so you know it's a mixed bag though kind of like what's going on in the world people are one extreme or the other um, so but, what yeah. is the deal right now are you recommending that people book travel are you booking it way in advance because i know you know if you want to go to certain resorts certain hotels certain times of the year you those are year out you know bookings i mean i've gone skiing for years at christmas and it's a pain in the ass and i don't like to plan that far out um so what what are you seeing because i would imagine you've got this big overflow of people who have been pushing back and that's going to push forward. So is there even going to be anywhere to go? What are you suggesting people do right now? Uh, a lot of people have just postponed for a year out, but very honestly, I mean, it's not that you can't get into places. I mean, these places have been decimated. The travel industry has been decimated and I don't see that. I think that you can, you know, I, I think I'm suggesting for right now <laughs> that people you know, stay a little closer to home as far as, or go further out, you know, this in-between stuff's a little bit tough with the travel bans and, you know, closing borders and opening borders and people getting stuck. That was a big thing. So we want to, you know, make sure that they can have a great experience and it doesn't turn, it turn into a stressful nightmare. So right now we're just saying, you know, let's, let's stay in the U S here this summer for the most part and well, I guess they're making us right talk to me about the borders where, where are the rules on that right now well the EU just basically shut down the US but that's that was a recommendation so I think Florida's to blame but whatever Florida, California yeah uh, um, but you know you can you can technically go to certain places and so how's that? Tell, yeah. tell me how I get somewhere out of America. No offense, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, yesterday I was on the phone with Ireland and they really, really want us Americans to come. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, they have a 14 day quarantine, which is supposed to be lifted on July 9th. But the quarantine come to be told that it is recommended and advised but it's not really being enforced <laughs> so ah. it, you know i probably shouldn't be that's right that. up my alley i like that okay <laughs> for all you rebels out there yeah uh, this is just a technicality so you know you're supposed to fill out forms and blah 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 but you can go and um to ireland um starting this week if you really so chose and uh starting on the ninth you can the ban is supposed to be lifted for the quarantine. So, wow. you know, there's, there's places um, outside of this country. Does it rain? Let's see, I'm, what, I'm trying to remember. What is the rainy season in Ireland? Uh, kind of always, but this is the best. Kind of always, okay. Yeah, yeah July, is, July, August um, is, is their best time right now. So Okay, yeah. so we can go to Ireland. Where else can we go without, uh, you know, swimming and, and climbing under a wall to get there. This has all changed in the past 24 hours. So here oh, yeah, I'm really problem. catching you. <laughs> Herein lies the problem. Portugal says that we were going to be allowed to come. So, you know, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to match up what the government's recommending versus, you know, the airlines. You sure you can book a flight, but then when you get there, what happens? Um, you know, oh, so you're saying you're afraid you, you book a client because mm -hmm. the airline might be taking the reservation even if you might yes. get stopped at the border. That's right. Yeah. Holy cow. So we're not working together on this right now. That's the thing. Yeah. So we, um, and, and this week happens to be one of those weeks where, you know, everything was becoming clear and now it's a little less clear. So before I would want to book any trip right now, I would want to make sure all of that is aligned. The government regulations the airline regulations the hotel regulations and so that you don't get over there and have a problem and you so know, that's why you use a consultant or an agent yeah. because you can call directly to the airline you can get i don't know if you get something in writing but you can certainly get more clarity yes definitely and so is the feeling that more places more countries 
are going to open up or is the feeling that we really should uh, assume that until there's a vaccine, you know, it's going to be a challenge? No, I do think that there's going to be more countries that are going to open up to us. Um, Just because they can't survive without us? Yes, basically. And you know Uh what? And we can't survive without them. So we're so interconnected. The, The world is so global now. And so it's really, you know, it's very different than 10 years ago or or 20 years ago of how reliant we are on each other. Um, Right. Yeah. So I, and you know, they review this every two weeks. So I think if two weeks, mm -hmm, so if things settle down, then in two weeks, I think a lot of the places that we're planning to open to the U S will reopen to the U S so come on, Florida. No kidding. My God. If everybody can just stay off the beaches for July 4th, maybe we can go to Italy. Yeah. All right. We need a campaign on that. Um, And so if, how is the industry doing as far as generally speaking, right? Non-corona, there are cancellation policies and there's this thing called insurance that I never elect to get. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a person who's saying, I'm going, I'm booking it, I'm going July 9th, I'm off to Ireland, no matter what, I don't care. Talk to me about the what ifs and, and how is the industry holding up to, you know, their end on that stuff? You know, I think pretty much everybody's being so flexible right now. First of all, they don't want you coming. So all you have to do, to do is pretty much say, I think I might have Corona or I'm not feeling too well. So, you know, even if they're, ah. I, I think that nobody really wants you coming there if you, it's you sort know, of like when I claimed mold and got out of a lease. Exactly. Okay. Got we're it. All above, we're all above board here. So really. Of course. Was, I didn't suggest anyone do that. Mm-mm. So really, um, everybody's so flexible. I mean, 24 hour cancel, pretty much, you know, give your money back. People are offering 20% bonus if you, you know, have to cancel and reschedule. You know, they just want you to come. They are, but they're holding their prices steady. And that was the next question. Are, are you seeing deals? Because for flights, I, I've not been seeing deals, but what are you seeing? No, you're not seeing deals. And partly it's because, um, you know, they can't be at capacity on the planes. They're between 50 and 70%. And so the economics don't work. The, the numbers don't pan out. But the other thing I will say is the hotels need to, they need to hold steady because this is a slippery slope. It's already been, you know, a nightmare for so many businesses. And if they start undercutting each other or, or giving deals that you're basically kind of devaluing and, and it could be a Pandora's box then. It is. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I I think they're really, really trying to maintain, you know, a a price structure that's and and give other perks, you know, to, to welcome people. But yes, prices are, are, there's no great deals out there. Overall, I'm not saying you can't find one, but I'm just saying that there, there's a purposeful attempt to keep prices stable. Yeah, I've, I've not heard of any major, you know, cruise line, the airlines, you know, they're getting some bailouts, um, the hotel chains. I've not heard of anything major going under. Of course, personally, I wouldn't mind if a couple of the major ones went under. But and see, Marriott owns everything now. That's Say it again. Marriott owns everything now. So as long as Marriott's around, there's places to stay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we don't necessarily want them to go under, of course. Um, but of course not. They they really they they're kind of a monopoly now. So you would be surprised who who Marriott owns. They own some boutique chains, some high end luxury chains. They've they're they're a big boy now. So beyond what you would think. Yeah. You're but right. No, really not. Nothing major that's been announced, which is, which is great news, you know? Well, you hope in these, you know, the, the beauty of even America, um, I love traveling internationally, but, um, I certainly, there's some spots, um, in the States that had some good trips and some, still some places that need to go. Um, and so Corona might light my fire and get me going on that. But, you know, the, the smallness, you know, like we were talking about earlier, the small towns and the charm and the, the restaurants with eight tables um, and the boutique 
even call them hotels or more like bed and breakfast, if that, you know, those are the ones you worry about. And I don't know that you would necessarily know if those are out of business yet per se, right? Because that's sure. a, a lot of communication. Sure. Yeah. It's hard to keep up with all of that, but really there's been very, very few. And we do work with you know, tiny boutique hotels all the way up. So uh, I feel like everybody's kind of joined together and gotten through this first wave and, you know, most everything has been able to stay afloat. So, you know, we'll see if we have a second one, but, um, you know, and a lot of these places are seasonal anyway, if you think about it. That's a good point. Yeah. So, you know, they didn't, yes, they're missing their summer season, but the whole, March, April, May, a lot of these places don't get tourists during that time. So it's a good timing. Mm -hmm, Good timing. So long as we don't have a second wave, second wave, (laughs) perhaps my two least favorite words. Yes. Come on vaccine. Um, Well, I saw today that the um, director of the NIH said that we will have one by the end of the year and we'll have 300 million doses. Hey, hey, let's go. Let's go. I wonder if there will be a requirement that you have to have been vaccinated to travel to certain countries. Okay, so that is that is one thing that's happening that might help. Hawaii is opening their borders August first, and they're going to require. They were requiring a fourteen day quarantine, and instead, they're going to now um, allow you to come if you had a COVID test within forty eight hours, and said that's negative. So, and Alaska was doing the same thing. So I think we might see now that testing is more available, that might ah. be able to travel. Um, okay. So I, uh, yeah, I did, um, I did an opinion piece on, on that because, you know, you got to watch the numbers going up when we talk about spikes, but there is more in the numbers because there are more people than ever just kind of wanting to get tested. Mm-hmm. And this might be another reason so they can travel. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Okay, so let's pretend okay. that the vaccine is out and people are ready to go. So let's go there. Let's go off the nose, if you will. So you got to have your top go to. First of all, I'm going to imagine that your favorite client says, I want to go, I don't care what it costs. Tell me someplace totally cool to go. Do you get those? Yes. And, you know, I was even thinking about where would the first place I'd want to go or send certain people. And, you know, I, I, I like to do a lot of adventure travel. And I think this is a perfect time to do outdoor adventures for, you know, people who love that and maybe some people who want to try something new. So, Well, that's true, too, because a lot of people want to be outdoors versus in, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So a a few of the trips in mind that I I would start with would be some really cool outdoor adventures. Let's hear it. Not for all clients, okay? So here's one that I think is is really fun and interesting, and it's um, doing the Swiss oat route, okay? And that is, it means a hut-to-hut trip. And it is in between Chamonix, France. It starts there, which is in the French Alps, the home of Mont Blanc, which is the second highest peak in Europe. And you hike for 13 days, if you have 13 days, over 117 miles. And you end up in (laughs) Zermatt, Switzerland, which is in the Swiss Alps, the home of the Matterhorn which is the steepest slope in Europe. So you cross 11 mountain passes and you can do it in 12 or 13 days. And So you hike all day? You hike all day. You could do it by skiing, by the way, if you want to do it in the winter. And that's about a seven-day trip. And you stay in, there's a couple different routes you can go. Um, the original route is more technical and you'll have portions uh, you know, that are a little tough. You want to do that with a guide. You, know, you have to cross a little bit over a glacier. Glacial areas, you'll need crampons, there's ropes, so it's a little more technical. That's definitely not for everybody. Oh um, my God. Yeah. Can but, you do that? Like, can somebody carry you? Is there, are there like little <laughs> yes, buggies that can take some of our listeners? Yes, the Swiss Sherpa, you call them. 
Um, I love the Sherpa. Okay. Uh, or a guide, a uh, hiking guide. These guys, see the, the European guides, like none of this is a big deal for them, right? Us uh, Americans, this is a big yeah, deal. Yeah, we're lazy as shit, but okay. So there, uh, this is just a, a, a walk in the park. But anyway, so, but you can do, they have a walker's route, which is super well marked and you stay low, you stay at like 3,000 feet. So there's no altitude issues. There's nothing technical. It's really well marked. Anybody can do it if you're in decent shape, good shape, let's go with good shape. And you stay in these mountain huts, they're super charming. The food, it would be amazing. And then you stay in these little towns and these like Swiss chalets. And at the end, you are in, in the beginning and at the end, you're in two really charming Swiss and French Alp towns. Wow. And great hotels, great food, um, very charming walkable towns. and. You know, you can get, you can actually get there pretty easy. You fly into Geneva. Um, and it's only about a 45 minute drive to Chamonix where you start. So you could spend a few days in Geneva if you want a little bit of, you know, city culture and head down and then uh, start the trek and finish in, in Zermatt. So I love this. So summer or winter, any, really anytime. Yeah. I mean, the skiing is probably also on the more challenging side, but yes, you could totally do summer or winter. Okay. Love this. Okay. This is for the adventures or if you've been a fat ass during Corona, look, yes. you can hike 13 different mountain faces. I think you said. Yeah. And I would imagine you could at least lose 13 pounds by the end of that. Yeah. It's 11 mountain passes, but okay. We'll go 11. 13 pounds and 11 passes. <laughs> There's hope. Okay, that is that is off the nose. All right, what else you got? Okay, well, okay, I think we should definitely maybe head to Israel and Jordan. Oh, um, yeah. On my on my dream list, yeah. First, we have to thank God that we're traveling and for whatever else we need to thank God for. And yes. I think, um, you know, Israel is historic. It's humbling. It's thought provoking. I mean, the history there is just unimaginable, you know, that you're dating back beyond biblical times and you can truly feel the magnitude of what's happened there in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and for, for every religion, I mean, the, the, the Jewish history, the Christian history, the Muslim history that is all in this one area is pretty amazing. But what's also cool about it is it's also one of the most modern cutting edge places, Tel Aviv, it's one of the most progressive liberal cities with modern architecture and you're right on the beach and it's beautiful. It's got uh, art and, and graffiti and. So if you're into, if you're into culture, it's sort of a no brainer. And depending on your uh, religious affinity or your experience you can probably see it through the eyes of whomever you want if you're a muslim you can see it from a muslim perspective if you're christian and so forth yep yes and so yep. then what do you do if you know culture is okay um what what kind of cool excursions are there well okay so first of all israel is the size of new jersey so you can really have a completely different experience and very easily so Tel Aviv, okay, it's a modern city. If you don't want to go to the art museums um, and see the architecture, uh, you can go to the beach there. You can, you know, there's nightlife, there's mm -hmm. you know, great food, there's markets, you know, you can bike there, there's port towns, so that's fun. But then I would say you would want to head north to like um, the mountainous area. So you're right on the border of Syria and Lebanon and you have the views of the Golan Heights and, you know, you can, and the Sea wow. of Galilee is up there. So there, not only can you, you're in this place that there's, you know, the tension of, you know, these border regions, but you can learn about the initiatives that are going on for peace and hope. Or if you don't want to do that approach, you can hike, you can rappel, you can do water activities, you can kayak, there's wineries up there. And you can even ski there in the winter. Most people don't realize you can ski in Israel. And Holy then cow, never heard of that. Villages and things like that. But what a cool experience would be to go um, and stay on a kibbutz for a few days. A kibbutz. And, uh, a kibbutz. Okay. That's a communal living settlement that's usually based around agriculture or some sort of industry. 
and you stay and you volunteer and you do some sustainable farming or bio tours and you live and work among the community and you meet the people, people stay for months you could, and it's life changing for a lot of people. Even a few days can be, you know, just seeing how these people live um, and they're so, you know, they so work together and it's just like such a loving, cool community. And so, is it safe? Ah, that's the other thing. Everybody worries about Israel being safe. It's one of the safest places to visit. Don't yeah. they have just unbelievable, um, I don't want to say military, because that's not going to sound appealing to some people, but they're just but a buttoned up society, aren't they? You know, it's funny because, um, well, they're buttoned up as far as their security is kick ass. I mean, yeah, you can get on that plane without having every inch, you know, of your suitcase searched by every possible machine, dog, you name it. People. Right. Um, so, but, you know, they do have a military presence. Everybody has to serve in the Israeli army, uh, women and men. And, but it doesn't feel, you know, like it, it, they're very friendly. When I was there, we picked up, they, you know, the, the, they'll hitchhike and you give them rides, you know, the military people. Oh so, my God. Throwback. Okay. Yeah, really cool. So yeah, it's very safe. Never have I heard of a complaint of anybody feeling unsafe there. Okay. I love this. So we've, we've hiked the mountains. We've gone to Israel. What oh, else? I'm done with Israel. See in, in one other spot, which I think we've, obviously you have to go to Jerusalem, right? Which is sure. a given. Mm -hmm. I want to take you to um, the border of uh, in Jordan and um, you go out in the desert out to Wadi Ram where they like film Lawrence of Arabia just to get a picture in your mind. And they've got the seven pillars, these seven jagged rocks and you can go out and do like a camel tour and Jeep tour out in the desert. That's fun. But what's really cool is you stay in a Bedouin camp. Bedouins are the nomadic Arabic people who inhabit the desert and they're in, divided into like tribes and clans and they, they just dwell in the desert. And you can go stay with them in one of their luxury desert camps and you eat their traditional meals. You sit around the fire. Seriously? You know, their culture, their poetry, their dances. Yeah. So that I love this. Really fun and interesting. And then, you know, you must go over to um, Petra, which is one of the seven world, wonders of the world, the archaeological site that's half as old as time and uh, so well preserved. It's one of the most well preserved archaeological sites. So. It's called this Rose City. That's the color of the stone. And you can hike in this area too. So, you know, Israel, you can really do everything. You could do adventure. You can do, you know, culture, history, you know, desert, the, the, the beach. You have it's super easy to get around. So I put that high on my list. For our next it sounds time. like a cool, if you have, as I am, am in this phase now, you have, uh, you know, your kids are older, but still young enough that they want to do different things than you want to do. I like the Israel for that because, you know, when you go hiking 11 mountain faces, you got to be all in. But, yeah. the, you know, and then the Israel trip seems much more, you could make that a family oriented trip. Super family oriented. Great food. And, you know, it, it's, you can do multi-generational there and everybody can have a great time together. And yeah. And do independent. So, yeah, I think. Awesome. Great family trip. Great family trip. Where else? Where else? Okay, so this one, let's think, I know this is something that you'd be interested in, is Rwanda. Oh, yes. That was a trip I've been wanting to plan. Yes, Rwanda. Okay, so some people have heard of this because Ellen DeGeneres and her wife, um, Portia de Rossi, I think, are behind, not I think, they are behind um, a lot of the redevelopment there. So that it's been in the news from that perspective, but tell us about Rwanda. Okay, well, I think Rwanda, you know, is a little bit of a, a different spin on an African safari, right? Um, of course, an African safari has to be on everybody's list as well, but, you know, here you're gonna gain a new appreciation for golden monkeys and the silverback gorillas, which are very, very in, critically endangered, right? And you're also helping researchers understand these, you know, primates. And so this is something you want to combine with something else because you can't spend too many days there. Um, there's not that many gorillas and you need a permit to go see them. So what you would do is you'd fly into there, you'd spend a night there, and then you'd either 
uh, take a four by four Jeep up uh, the uh, mountain area. There's like eight volcano peaks. So you could spend a day or two exploring that area and hiking or climbing in the volcano. But what you want to do is you want to get into the area for the gorilla trekking. And there's only three countries that they have these endangered great apes that are surviving. It's Rwanda, Uganda, and the Congo. So uh, Rwanda is probably the best option. And so they have some really nice accommodations, but um, you're going to have be assigned to a family of gorillas. And so in the morning, you're gonna, your guide is going to know where your gorillas are, and you have to kind of go hike to that area anywhere from like two to four hours, and you're weaving through bamboo forests and rainforests, and it's really beautiful. And then you get to actually hang out with these gorilla families, and they're pretty interactive. You have to stay about seven meters back, but, you know, they'll just stare in your eyes. And oh, they'll, my God. They'll gaze at you. They're they come closer than the seven meters. Um, so you have to kind of back off because they want to. There's no social distancing with the gorillas. Distancing, and they're so gentle. And, um, you know, you get to just really, really spend time. Watching. And so if I understand, and you mentioned it, and when I read about it um, a little bit, that interaction is being uh, analyzed. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's the research. Like, they are analyzing everything that's happening and taking notes and, and whatever that looks like. I believe the guy does that or there's somebody with each group. I can't remember. It, well, it's a, it's a guide. Okay. We'll take you and they, and they're, I mean, they know these animals, they know all of the gorillas. They'll have names for them. So they, they've really studied them and, and then they'll watch how they interact with the different families. And, and um, so there's no, the cool part about this is it's a guarantee, right? It's like taking your kid fishing for the first time. My God, if you don't catch a fish, you're never taking them fishing again. And when you go on those safaris, it's, you know, I've not been um, on a traditional safari, but from everybody I've talked to, it is amazing, but beyond, and many people say best trip of their life, but there is a lot of waiting. Yes. Definitely. No, you're, you're guaranteed. You will, they, they know where they are. And there's only about 10, 10 gorilla families in the certain region. So you're assigned an actual family. So you know exactly, they know exactly where they're at. You know, they kind of. I love this. So for the traveler with no patience, like me, uh, head to Rwanda. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Okay. This is fun. And then you can pair it with another part of the country. I, I would imagine there's, um, I don't know, is there water? Yeah. Um, so that's a good one to do. Um, you could do Zanzibar, which okay, you know, right in the Indian Ocean. And, you know, you'll have crystal clear waters and white sands and water sports if you want to do that. Or you could do a game reserve. You know, it's quite far from going all the way down to South Africa. It's like an 11 or 13 hour flight. So people just think it's easy to, you know, pair with anything in Africa, but Africa is a pretty large continent. So, you know, depending how long you have, but you're close to Victoria Falls. So there's plenty to do, um, plenty of different regions to, to, to combine. To combine. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah. Okay. So we can hike, we can head to Israel and do tons of different things. We can go to Rwanda, which, like you said, everybody should have a trip to Africa on their on their list at some point. Where? What's your dream trip when you get out? Yeah, <laughs> that's tough. Um, gosh, you haven't been noodling or planning or booking and so and rebooking. Many. It's so many. I have so many. It's hard to say a dream trip. And that's what's so cool about travel. You know, I feel like it's hard to capture in words, but, you know, every experience um, is so valuable. I mean, we become more open minded. You see the common thread of people that ties us together where you're going. So, I mean, I think travel helps cultivate empathy and by seeing the different customs and the different people and you know, patience and open mindedness. And so I really, I just want to keep traveling and there's so many. Yeah. Areas. So I, you know, I think it's just limitless. 
but um, are you are you excited to get on a cruise anytime soon? I, you know, I, I what's going to happen there? Yeah, you know, cruisers love to cruise. I'm not a cruiser. I so know. Cruisers love to cruise, and they're not afraid, and they're doing a ton of stuff with the air filters, kind of like the planes. You know, a lot of cruise ships, a lot of the smaller ships, the river cruises are really popular. So, you know, people kind of just float down the river. You're pretty much outside um, and you're off the ship every day. So Those I, are in I, Europe primarily? Mm -hmm, in, in Germany and in the uh, Douro River in Portugal, um, in the Rhine River, you could. Um, so there's a couple, couple different rivers they're doing on from like Budapest to Hungary through Germany all those uh, regions and you go get to go to the small towns. That's another way to see the small towns. Um, there's small boats, a couple hundred people, 150 people. So I think there's, there's still a, a place for cruising, yachting. A lot of people are like that. So I like the yachting word better. I like the yachting word too. <laughs> I might yacht. I don't know about a cruise just sounds, ah, I mean, look, a lot of people do cruises because it's a great way to see places on a budget and I get it. You get to sleep while they take you from one place to the next. You don't yeah. be on the train. So, you know, I just, I think there's a market for it. And I think that same market will, you know, they'll come back. I do think so. Look, yeah. we're going to have, we're going to have a vaccine in, and, you know, hopefully I think that we are transformed forever, but I, I do think that, you know, our memories can be a little bit short and, so people will be excited to travel. But yeah, I'm not getting on a cruise ship anytime soon. But I never liked it. I never liked to cruise. So from the beginning, I know but there is a market. So yeah, you know, you make great points about travel. And it makes sense, you know, why you had that, you know, moment in your life, and you did a bunch of different stuff. And then you said, Wow, how about I plan other people's trips? almost go on the trip with them and share that experience, which is phenomenal. And I'm sure when you see those uh, moments that come out of them, you know, those aha moments, those memories, it just makes it all worth it. I don't know if it makes it worth it, all the refunds and the uh, pain in the ass customers, but it probably gets pretty close. Yeah, it does. And you know what, even the planning, the, the planning and the anticipation, people having something to look forward to ah, you know, yeah. right now. And, you know, I think, you know, if you travel, it, it really, it's, it's like scientific. It reduces depression. It, it reduces stress. It changes your relationships. It, it helps you pick a career that you're, you know, because you, you have clarity in your mind. So, you know, when you're a part of that, for people, it kind of supersedes some of the other stuff. That's so cool. Do you think yeah. you're going to stay in on this on this path, or well, who knows? My plan is to take another pivot and to, um, when my other son graduates, to travel the world myself and to be a nomad, uh, in a sense. So for a period of time, I'm going to check out and I'm going to do that and. Um, live all over the world and take advantage of, of, you know, this opportunity. I want to see how big your backpack is. <laughs> it's funny. And what the goes in that go, thing? The longer you go, the less you realize you need. And yeah, I did it once before when I was in, in my twenties and you know, you, you traveled realize, around the world, traveled around the world in a backpack, in a backpack. Yes. Wow. Five dollars a day. So you five? Know, it has to be, uh huh. Yes. You really got to choose. I swear to God, it's it's super easy. Mm -hmm. Once you get your, you buy an around the world ticket, and you get about you know five stops. You have to go in the same direction, so that's the one thing. If you want to get back somewhere, you have to take the long way, and you um you get your, your you get your train ticket, and you know outside of that, once you invest in that, you can you can do it relatively inexpensively. So there's all ways to do it. And there's at that age, I mean, everybody, you know, is okay, you know, sleeping on couches and hooking yep. up and sharing and probably had a night or two in a park or a bus station. Who cares? Yeah. On, on the trains. You can sleep on the trains in Europe. So that's Oh my great. God. I love that. Yeah. So you know what? That's what I say to the millennials. Just take the time and, and 
you know, don't get on the race to nowhere and take that time, take that year, take that six months, you know, everything else will be waiting right here. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, we know that. Yeah. And you're right. It opens up your mind. And, and I like how you said, if you're thinking about what's next, or maybe you're in a dead end career, which we talk about a lot on the show, or, you know, you don't quite know how to take the fork in the road or pivot, take a trip with the goal in mind to try to find that clarity. I love that. And it's not, it's not how many places you go. It's how much you immerse yourself and how much you, and how much time you spend. So, you know, there's nothing more valuable than, than that time. So I would just say to anybody who has an opportunity or save up your vacation and sick dates, but you know, to take that time and really immerse yourself, it doesn't, you don't have to go to lots of places, but it can just be in nature or by yourself or meeting the locals in one area that can transform you. So I think, yes. Okay. Well, so you got it. You got it. I know you're going all nomad and living yes. off uh, bread and cheese and yes. you know, yes. your sweatshirt and your backpack, yes. but you got to check back in with us because we'd love to see what kind of clarity that brings you and, and where you are in a year. In your life. Okay. You got it. I have Sounds lots more tips for you too. So, anytime. okay. Happy planning and, and traveling and it's been great catching up. And I have faith. I see the light at the end. And I think we will get out. Looks like we can start to get out July 9th. Looks like Hawaii wants to see us. Yeah. And, and so everybody uh, stay tuned and, and talk to agents and stay tuned to the news information. Because as Robbie says, it's changing every two weeks. So Every day, really. But yeah, <laughs> officially every two weeks. But officially every, every two weeks. Every uh-huh. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Rob. It's been great. Okay. Okay. Take care. Happy travels. Better change up your perspective. Hope you guys enjoyed the show today. Remember our little talk before the show? Yep. Don't forget to subscribe, like, follow, share, all that jazz. It matters, people. You matter. Thanks again for listening. See you soon.